Hello and welcome to another episode by Decrypting Crypto and Breakout Solutions. I'm your host, Wasim Debussy, and as you guys know, every now and then I like to interview some really, really amazing people to give you guys some insights about the background of Bitcoin and crypto and, and what's happening in the world and how all of this stuff works. Um, I've been fortunate enough to meet Patrick, who I am. Um, actually, we got talking on LinkedIn a little while ago, a few months back, and he was actually living in El Salvador. And I was actually really, really interested in that because as you guys will have seen from a lot of my videos, I'm a big, big fan of El Salvador, what President Nayib Bukele is doing over there. And they've got, you know, they've got Bitcoin as legal tender. Um, and they're working on creating the Bitcoin standard over there, which for me is, I believe El Salvador is going to be a financial hub of the future where a lot of business is going to come in because of the freedom, the decentralization, the opportunity that Bitcoin presents, you know, when everything else around the world is going the opposite way with control and government overreach and all that kind of stuff. So we had a chat a little while ago and then um, I, I messaged Pat a couple of weeks ago just saying, hey, man, you know, I'm thinking about El Salvador. I want to come check out the country. Can you give me some insights? And we jumped on a Zoom call. He started telling me some really, really interesting stuff about his journey and what he does. And he's actually, I want to let him introduce himself in a moment, but to give you a little bit of a, um, a sneak peek, Patrick actually is a programmer on the Bitcoin blockchain. So he works with companies that do um, businesses on, on Bitcoin or companies that are building businesses on Bitcoin. So he understands the Bitcoin blockchain better than anybody I've met. So I thought, you know what? What might be a great idea is we bring Patrick over to this on, on a show, you know, even if it's 15, 20, 30 minutes, and just really find out, you know, what got him so into Bitcoin at such a young age and where he sees the future and where he sees the, the benefits and, and, you know, and why, you know, some people call Bitcoin an apex asset and why that's the case. So without any further ado, I want to welcome Patrick. Patrick, welcome to the show. Um, thank you very much for getting up your time. I know it's like, what's the time? It's like 6.30 in the morning in the UK right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, uh, well. <laughs> yeah, so 6.30 in the morning then while we're recording this, you probably won't be 6.30 there when you guys are watching it because it will be pre-recorded. But just to show you how dedicated this young man is, and I was really, really impressed by him. So, Patrick, let us know a little bit about your background and how you got into Bitcoin and what that journey was like for you. Sure, yeah. Well, I've basically been programming since um, I was about 13, just got absolutely hooked. Um, but I could found a way to crack my online maths homework site and then... Like after that, I was just hooked. Like if you can do this and you can make your life so much easier with programming, um, yeah, just got hooked. Um, started went to work straight away after um, high school. But during high school, I actually did a um, a project in my computing class on Bitcoin. So I built a, like an advertiser network where you would get paid out for hosting ads on your site in Bitcoin. And that this was around like 2014, 2015. Um, went went up to London for quite a few. Uh, meetups and but basically thought of bitcoin as internet payments it was like you know i was like 16 or 17 at the time and you know it was difficult getting bank accounts and credit cards and stuff so i was like right if 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 anyone can just send and receive money on the internet this is great so that's how i thought of bitcoin back then then you know kind of <laughs> other shit happened i forgot about bitcoin for a while 2017 rolled around bull market and grab my attention again and I started thinking of it more as like a stock like you you might want to have a few you know a few uh, pounds in this thing because it might do well in pound terms bitcoin crashes massively again um I forget about it again for a few years 2020 rolls around um they print trillions for the covid uh, crisis um obviously a great new bunch of material gets put online vis-a-vis -vis bitcoin and it's just so much easier to go oh this is money like this isn't an investment it's not internet payments it's just money it's just incredibly it's, it's perfected money it's the first engineered money um and then since then just been in the in the in the rabbit hole as, as they say right and um trying to learn as much as possible about it but you know in the in the early 2020s um I went to work for when it first started clicking. Um, I went to work for a crypto exchange in in London, actually. Um, so I've seen a lot of. It's not just been Bitcoin the whole time. It's been uh, you know I've seen a lot of crypto, um, and in the end, that also is part of that was what drove me to be more Bitcoin focused. 
Um, but, but we can talk about that um, yeah. as well. You know, and I think you said something which, you know, just triggered something in my head. You said that Bitcoin is money that you can send over the internet. And I remember when I first started into Bitcoin, I started seeing the term Bitcoin is the internet's native currency. And I didn't get it. I did not get it in the beginning. Like, you know, three years ago, um, you know, similar to you, maybe two and a half years ago, I, I got into Bitcoin, as most of you guys know, in 2017, or crypto, or I got into Bitcoin in 2017, but I got scammed because I knew nothing I was doing. And, um, and I was resistant. I got in back in 2021 after, after the pandemic and all that kind of stuff. And like, like Patrick said, you know, trillions of dollars were being printed. And I just wasn't making any sense of this. I'm like, how can they print money out of nothing? Where's this money coming from? And that's why I got interested. And I started reading Bitcoin is the internet's native currency. And that did click for a good year and a half of what that actually means. What does that mean to you when you hear the, the term Bitcoin is the internet's native currency? Yeah, well, I think the, the most important thing is that anyone who has access to the internet does have access to Bitcoin. Like that's huge. But it, in recent days, we've seen some interesting stuff about um, HTTP 402 payment required. Uh, so, you know, everyone knows the 404 not found. Um, mm -hmm. and, and 402 is, is a payment, it's, a, it's an error code that's been around for, I mean, I think forever since, you know, since the internet's been around. Um, but we've never had a native currency that can kind of satisfy that 402. So everything on the internet is either free and paid for by ads and spam and, you, you know, abusing your attention, or it's kind of really clunky subscriptions where, you know, all of a sudden they bill you 50 quid because you forgot to cancel your subscription, you know? So I think we're about to see a, a new generation of apps where, first of all, you eliminate spam. Um, because suddenly it's it's not profitable to write a billion comments if every comment costs you a cent, you know. Um, and yet for your average user, you know, you set a, um, two bucks a month for your YouTube account. Uh, you can comment and like and whatever whatever you want, no problem. But the spammers are just not going to be profitable. And um, actually, that's a bit of an experience I have as well because I launched a, a LinkedIn company a few years ago uh, doing LinkedIn automation. So. Um, so yeah, you just know that the, the 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 model is gone if you suddenly have to start paying per message, per like, per retweet, um, and it's just going to destroy the bot. So I think we we're going into an era of a very clean internet that suddenly has this like it has deposits and uh, and toll roads and stuff like that, where now we can really clean up the internet and 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 also, you know, like there'll be new business models that are now um, profitable because you don't have to put ads on your content. You can um you can ask per minute that people stream you money or or just you know put a, a bitcoin donation link or whatever whatever it is you know um it's going to change the internet significantly yeah i totally agree with you and one of the biggest things and one thing we're talking a little bit about that is you know the whole permissionless and trustless side of bitcoin is you know no matter where you're around the world you can send money directly to the person without having a third party intervening and charging you and you know, and blocking you if they if they think, you know, they don't want the transaction go through. And we're starting to see a lot of this in Australia. You know, a lot of our clients have been, um, you know, giving us feedback about some of the challenges they're having right now with banks. And, you know, we've been seeing it all over the news in America over the past six months, where it's actually starting to happen here in Australia. We're starting to see, you know, um, banks closing down, like 50% of ATMs in Australia um, since 2021. Like, there's been a reduction, about 50% of ATMs in Australia. So we're definitely moving to that digital uh, cashless society. It's, it's, no, it's no secret. Um, but in your opinion, you know, what makes Bitcoin unique in, in the sense that, you know, it can actually, um, you know, withstand all the challenges of being an, an internet currency, but also provide the safety, the security and the freedom and liberties and all the stuff we've been talking about to its users? Yeah. Well, I think there's a couple of things. Um, very importantly, is obviously proof of work. You know, um, valuable things are expensive. You know, uh, it, it, proof of work is expensive, but it's it's valuable. It's necessary, um, and 
you know we can see that in the in the in the real world as well you know if you want to keep your property safe you need to spend a lot of energy protecting it you know we can go into more detail there and i think the other thing is um the the actual decentralization you know bitcoin is so simple compared to you know these chains that chains that do half a million transactions per second or whatever they claim to do um and then they crash on every friday afternoon you know it's um bitcoin is not the same bitcoin is like keep it so simple that we can have 50,000, 100,000 nodes around the world on stupid like little calculator computers, but they're validating the transactions. They're copying the ledger and um, and keeping it safe. And, and we don't really, and Bitcoin has a completely different attitude to changing. Uh, you know, the internet hasn't changed in, in ages. You know, we've been, ever since we launched the internet, um, we knew we would need more IP addresses. There, you know, there's only like 3 billion with IPv4, you know, everyone knows the 192.168, whatever. There's only like 3 billion available addresses with that format. So we knew from the beginning that we would need more addresses. So they came up with IPv6 decades ago. And we're only just starting to see like, and it's still not properly ad adopted, right? So it takes ages to change um, or, or you don't even have to change. You just build around, like we built, um, we built um, modems and routers and stuff so that you could share a, a public IP address with like 10 internal addresses, right? Everyone, everyone does that. And we managed to build around that address limit. And it's kind of the same with Bitcoin. It's like, it's gonna be impossible to change and that's a good thing. Um, and if there's a problem, we'll probably figure out a way around it, or we will try and test something for 10 years and then roll it in. And that's the difference. You don't want to change your security model, your any any kind of model um, like that, because then you're going to have problems you didn't predict. And when the whole world's money is meant to be running on it, you don't want to mess with it. So I that's the difference in attitude, right, between Bitcoin and, and everything else. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Now, you, you started touching on about um, proof of work and energy and, you know, um, you know, energy is expensive or, you know, proof of work is expensive. Anything that has value has proof of work. And um, I remember in some of our chats, you, you actually, you, you made it very, very simple for me to understand, like, you were talking about single cell organs, organisms and you know, how they use proof of work and, and, and energy to protect themselves and you went all the way to nuclear power. So can you share that with the audience? Because I thought the way you explained it was just, you know, seamless and really made sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting. I mean, proof of work is is nothing new. You know, proof of work is how the whole world has operated so far. And, you know, not just in human disputes, but ever since there was life, which is, you know, collecting energy and protecting your energy, that's what life is. Mm -hmm. um you've had to use a portion of your energy to protect your energy so if you think like single-celled uh organism right they've got a little bit of an energy reserve within their cell membranes and they, they put up the cell membranes right it costs them energy it costs them like 10 percent of their entire available energy just a few joules right because they're small things but it's like still 10 percent of what they have and the reason they do that is to put up a barrier so that you know they don't lose or, or no one comes and steals the energy they have but then life evolved in this arms race for channeling and controlling energy. So, you know, we evolved um, like shells or teeth or eyes to better be able to see prey. And that's basically saying, okay, shit, I've only got, uh, you know, 100,000 joules of reserves. How do I best use this to be able to have more energy tomorrow? Uh, you know, and then over time, you evolve eyes and you evolve brains, which is a good model for determining will I have more energy in the future or not? Which path should I take to ha have more energy or not? And then you get up to the human era, and then and then you could the the arms race started outside the body, right? That's what technology is, and um, you know we, we use swords, shields, bows and arrows, spears, um, guns, bombs, tanks, and you know nuclear bombs, and those are all examples of using more and more energy um to to protect our energy reserves right um and so it's it's ex it's expensive but it's necessary and it works you know we're, we're now like four billion years into 
this uh, uh, this proof of work arms race and the world the surface of the earth is still decentralized between you know there's been there's been some big players you know we've had um we've had the roman empire that dominated the large portion of the earth the mongolian empire with the british empire obviously and first of all like those are all examples of them using energy in a good way you know the brits channeled energy across the seas and, and whatever and the romans had um they had like um they had like 50 percent more energy per capita per year available because of better production methods and whatever and that leads to being able to project more energy abroad right because you can feed your soldiers you can build um strongest spears and shields and whatever and you can go and take over Egypt and take their grain resources or whatever. So, so we've had examples of these empires that have done incredibly well, but they haven't lasted. And that's because of proof of work. Um, you know, in proof of work, you don't have to ask for the permission of the current majority stakeholder to overtake them. You can just overtake them. You can, uh, you know, you don't have to ask your enemy if you're allowed to build more tanks or or whatever. You can just do it. It's going to be difficult. You might not succeed, but you've always got the option to do that. And that's the difference between proof of stake, I think, as well. You know, um, I think it's confusing because proof of work, um, you know, I think everything in the real world is protected with energy. We can see that in the real world. And then people think that the digital world is something like outside of that universe. But it's just, it still lives in the real world and if you still want to protect it you, you you've got to use energy and it's just counterintuitive because we spent the last 100 years trying to make computers like so efficient you know faster cheaper smaller whatever so it's counterintuitive that now we want to use more energy to protect something that lives on the computer mm. but you know the cost the cost for everything in the world has been falling. You know, your shoes are cheaper, your coffee's cheaper, like by orders of magnitude for, compared to the last hundred years. The only thing that's more expensive is the cost to protect one meter squared of land, because that's always relative to how much energy your neighbor can spend to take that that land. And it's the same in 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 Bitcoin. You know, on a Bitcoin standard, the price of everything falls as people get more efficient. The only thing that gets more expensive is the cost to protect your access to the coin because the it depends on how much your neighbor is hashing to you know to potentially steal your coin right yeah interesting so and I, I love how you you like how you spoke about you know the proof of um, the proof of work in real life and in nature and I think you know a perfect example is I come as most of you guys know I come from a health and fitness background I found gyms and you know the body itself, the human body, you ration energy according. Like if a lot of people are thinking oh, to lose weight, just reduce the amount of energy that you're consuming, but then the body goes into shock and starts to preserve that energy because it knows how important it is. So you've got to give it enough energy for it to release energy. And I think that is very important. And I think a lot of people don't understand the difference of proof of work. And I really try to explain when I'm talking to people that Bitcoin, you know, even though yes, it's intangible and it's on the blockchain, it's on the in the cyber world or the internet world or whatever, there's a lot of energy that goes in to produce even one single Bitcoin. You know, um, so can you talk about that? Like why why is it, you know, like you know, 10, 13 years ago, you could mine a hundred bitcoins a day on your computer, on your laptop. Now we kind of dream about doing that today to mine a hundred bitcoins a day. It will cost a lot of, uh, will, will, inc- will require a lot of computing power, a lot of hash power, a lot of electricity. So why has that happened over the years? Can you explain that and how that protects Bitcoin? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. I, I thought it was interesting what you said about the, the health and fitness, though, because we, we see proof of work in, in nature the whole time. Like um, peacocks, right, they grow incredibly colorful tails uh, that takes a, a ton of energy to maintain and, and grow and so, um, they don't have a purpose other than to prove hey i'm fit i'm healthy pick me right and it's obvious you look at the the peacock and you know yeah shit that that peacock's healthy because it can grow those those feathers the energy speaks for itself the unhealthy peacock has got a falling apart a tail doesn't you know it's not impressive so we see proof of work in, in nature the whole time. That's the same as looking at two competing forks of Bitcoin and saying, 
that one's got more energy, right? It speaks for itself. And you don't have to trust anyone to say, yeah, this is the chain we're using because you can just see that one number of how much energy it contains, how much work it contains. Um, and again, the proof of stake isn't the same because it's as if all peacocks look the same because they don't contain any energy. Uh, they don't contain like an internal metric to decide this is a healthy chain. So it's basically you then have to trust someone to say, okay, which chain are we looking at? If you come new to the ecosystem, I can create a hundred competing proof of stake chains on my laptop in a matter of hours. And to an outsider, they all look the same. They look, they look the same valid. They don't know which one we're using. So that's a difference again between proof of work, proof of stake. Um sorry, I went off on a on a tangent there. What was the, what was the question? My question is, why is it that over the years, because you, know, you mentioned this in your in your previous comment, you said that you know, in the Bitcoin standard, excuse me, everything goes down in price, but the hash power of producing Bitcoin goes up in price because you're protecting the network. And I gave the example yeah. of, you know, you know, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, you could mine 100 Bitcoins on, on average laptop. Today, to mine 100 Bitcoins a day, you'd need a warehouse of computing power so how how is that over time protecting the network and how is that increasing the value of bitcoin yeah yeah i think you know it's interesting to think about bitcoin as if um you know the 21 million coins already exist um there's just kind of a um a release schedule for those coins and it's a subsidy to the bitcoin defense the digital property defense uh industry um, right, we're, we're subsidying these massive mining farms by um, by giving them part of these 21 million coins. Um, so you've got to bring the coins into circulation somehow, right? From if you imagine day zero, how do, who do I give the coins? You, so you probably it's a good idea to subsidy the defense industry of that network for you know, for the, you don't know how long you're going to need to subsidy them for. So why not just do it on an exponentially decreasing <laughs> supply schedule? So I think of it as that you've got the defense industry subsidy. And then um, people talk about how when the subsidy falls, so every four years, right, you have the subsidy that you give to the mining industry uh, with every block. And they talk about it having to be replaced by transaction fees, which I think is a, you know, it's a valid way to look at it. But I prefer to think of it as like a protection fee, right? Because we all pay, uh, you know, a proportion of our income to have some dude with a gun protect our land, protect our farm, right? They stand on the border and they have the ability to project a shit ton of energy and we pay them a fraction of our income every year to protect our property. Um, and that's the way, same way I think about Bitcoin is that, yeah, at some time, you know, I, I, in 50 years or whatever, the mining reward, will, the subsidy will won't be enough to sustain the industry, but instead it will be this, if you want to call it a tax, you call it a tax, you know, it's, um, you just have to pay some strong dude who's got the ability to project a lot of energy so that you are able to access your coins whenever you want. Um, so that's how I think about that, you know, um, there will be these big uh, companies, whether it's Google or whether it's coinbase or cash app or whatever that um that need to have the ability to put transactions on the chain every at the end of every day or during every day and so they need access to a bit of hash hash power for sure and then they just find a way to to um tax their users to be able to pay for that whether it's transaction fees or whether they monetize it some other way um who knows but, um, but yeah, and, and it comes on a money sense, you know, on a, on a money sense, there's a good quote, which is every money goes, um, the price of every money falls to its uh, cost of production. So, and, you know, well, the price of anything goes to, to its cost of production, right? So if you've got, um, if you're manufacturing lorries and you're able to do so and, and sell them at twice the cost of production, you're going to get a lot of money. People are going to see that. Entrepreneurs are going to undercut you until the price of a, a lorry equals the cost of production of a, a lorry, right? That's called commoditizing it. Yeah. And in money, it's exactly the same thing. If it costs you zero to produce a new banknote, well, you're going to do it. It's free energy to print and buy shit, right? Um, and, they, and, and the same. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they do, yeah. Well, it's only human, right? And a and hundred countries have done it before us it's not just us you know and they've all failed um 
they've all printed their money into oblivion. Um, but it, it, it counts with Bitcoin as well. And then you think, okay, what's the terminal cost of production of one Bitcoin? Infinity, <laughs> right? I, um, yeah, and then I think, you know, there was a quote that I read the other day, which is, you know, the difference, I can't remember the quote because it's off my head, but the meaning of it was, you know, with fiat currency, you know, you're using a currency that somebody else has the power to print of as much as they want for their use, but not your use. With Bitcoin, no one has the power to print, not even you. So, you yeah. know, everyone is an equal playing field. Everyone has to mine Bitcoin. Everyone has to buy Bitcoin at the same price it is right now. You know, there's, it's, it's a level, um, equitable playing field. And that's what really, really got me. I, I, I'll be honest. I got into Bitcoin in the beginning to make money. You know, it was after you know, 2020. And I had to close my business down. But when I, stood the, when I understood the ethos and the mission and the vision and what Bitcoin is actually trying to achieve in the world, I'm not here just for the money anymore. The money now is a side benefit, but I'm actually here for, for the equitable, fair monetary system that I think we've seen in, in, in mankind for thousands of years. You know, I mean, well, they had a yeah. look at the gold standard, but the problem with gold standard is there's gatekeepers that are protecting the gold. You don't know how much gold they have, and they can be lying. Oh. I don't think we should say that we were ever on a gold standard because who knows what is in those vaults in the banks in the central banks, you know, you can't, it's not verifiable. So how do we even know? And we obviously weren't on a gold standard because we had to come off it, right? We didn't have the gold to back the, the, the promises right. that were floating. That's right. Look, we are coming towards the end. So I do want to wrap it up in a minute, but tell me a little bit about the point, um, sorry, uh, the, uh, the proof of stake. So the difference, we spoke a lot about proof of work. Now, just to close off, what is proof of stake for those that don't understand it? Sure. Yeah, I mean, we, we spoke about, I mean, we, everyone knows why it's attractive, right? It's claiming to do what proof of work does, but for free, basically. No energy required. Um, and we, we talked about how it falls short in one area, which is you come... You, you you log you you connect your computer to the internet you, you want to sync the chain you know to boot up your wallet or whatever and be able to tell you how many coins are yours which chain do you look at um you can't tell the difference between proof of stake chains because they don't contain that internal metric so now you need to go to the eth foundation or metamask or google or whoever and they'll tell you yeah we're using this chain um so that's one you know that's one thing where it falls short of proof of work. And I think it's really interesting because um, I think we've been able to do something similar to proof of stake for, for ages because it's, you know, you have every 10 minutes, you get the first 10 people who have um, a fraction of the key, right, to sign off on the state of some database. And um, we've been able to do like multi-sig stuff or, you know, you'll just check that there are, you know, uh, seven out of 10 signatures there and that block counts as, as valid, right? So we've been able to do that for some time. And the thing with that, that's basically what ETH is, except now you take your fraction of a key and you're able to sell it. And that's what an ETH coin is, right? You, It's a, it's a part of that multi-sig, uh, but you can sell your share to it. Um, and, you know, you we even were able to do fancy things like, okay, you've got 10 signers on this proof of stake um thing this you know, every 10 minutes they're signing off on a new block you're even able to do okay well if seven out of ten signers sign we can add a new signer in and now it's 11 people who have part of a key like we've been able to do that for for a while as well but the problem is now okay now i want to have a say i want to have a vote and the dudes who currently have the keys don't want to sign to give me a new key and they don't want to sell me their portion of the key right so I can't go on the markets and buy a significant amount of ETH because maybe the majority holder isn't wanting to sell their ETH because they want to retain a majority share. And um, there's no way for me to get a new part of the key other than that the current signers sign me in. So that's what's called permissioned, right? Um, and that's the difference between proof of work, where in proof of work, screw the current hashes, I'm going to go build my own hashing infrastructure and hash against them because the stake, if you want to call it right, the they're all proof of stake. It's just proof of work. The stake is external and infinite and not gate kept. 
And in proof of stake, the stake is internal and under the control of the current signers. Um, so in proof of work, you can go away and you can build your own key uh, by building this hashing infrastructure. And it's going to be difficult and you're probably not going to succeed, but you always have the option um, to go and build more tanks, build more mining, mining rigs, right? And hash against the current, current majority set. And that's the model that's worked so well for 4 billion years on, on the earth. And that's why we still have like almost 200 countries or something on the surface of the earth. And um, and there was no one empire that lasted forever. You know, there's no one uh, mining pool or, you know, mining pools aren't even the thing to look at, but like hashing companies that last forever, they will all at some point, whether it's 10 years or 20 years or 50 years down the line, falter and, and leave the place for a new person to step up. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I think that's the biggest thing is that, you know, with Bitcoin, the whole decentralization of Bitcoin is, that anybody can come in with enough power to you know, build up their power, make it stronger, and you know, become the dominant one. And that could be an evolving thing at a time. And plus, you know, every single person you know, downloads a node off of their computer and runs a node at home, then we're just making the, the whole network stronger and it doesn't cost you anything. Patrick, thank you very much for um, your time today. I really, really appreciate that. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to you to get to know more about what you do or I want to ask some questions about Bitcoin or some questions around blockchain um, coding or anything like that because I know that's what you do. How can people reach you? Sure. I mean, I'm uh, just a random guy on Twitter, Pats2Sats, P A T S 2 Sats. Um, and yeah, love talking about any of this stuff. So if anyone's got any questions, I'm always down to chat. Um, a lot of my stuff is copied from the people who came before, right? Uh, Jason Lowry, uh, great stuff about energy and proof of work. You see Michael Saylor. And the, also there's this great book here, um, Energy and Civilization, a History. Um, that it, it, it goes, you know, it's the first sentence is energy is the only universal currency. Um, and, and, you know, it goes, it, it's all about energy, but there's one sentence on, on money as well, which is... Um, energy just tries to you know currency money just tries to value the energy flows it, that we have in a society and and then in brackets it puts and it and it often um quite uh quite messily right because of all the, the currency problems bitcoin is trying to value energy flows worldwide perfectly and that's why it's a big deal it's going to save us so much misallocated energy as a as a society it's a big deal um yeah <laughs> perfect i love it thank you very much man i love your passion especially around the proof of work and stuff and energy i've definitely learned a lot um i'm going to look up that book and, and read it and i um yeah i'm looking forward to our future interactions with you man yeah nice one thanks a lot peace out guys and as always stay crypto